It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the member for Temiskaming Cochrane. My, my question is to the Premier. Late last week, City, knows, City News broke the news that the Ford government is looking to cut a variety of OHIP-covered health services. Not on the basis of what's good for patients, but to save half a billion dollars. The Premier's office quickly announced that they would not be asking patients to endure a colonoscopy without anesthetic, and that is a relief to many people in the province. <laughs> But that was just one of a long series of cuts the government is considering. Can the Premier tell us which health care services that he is planning to cut? Questions to the Premier. Minister of Health. Refer to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you very much, Speaker. And um, I thank the member for the question because it gives us the opportunity to um, let the people of Ontario know what's actually happening. First of all, the Appropriateness Working Group has been established as a result of the arbitrator's decision with the Ontario Medical Association, mm -hmm. and we are resetting the button on a relationship that has been fractured over 15 years under the previous government. We are in a very appropriate uh, place right now to be working with doctors to improve the patient experience across Ontario. With respect to the specific procedure that the member referred to, all medical and diagnostic tests are going to be based on what the needs of the patient are. And that specific uh, policy has not moved forward. It was based on the report was based on some old and outdated information. That Response. specific diagnosis was ruled out that that was not going to be happening, that the full anesthetic requirements that were necessary would be continued under that particular Must procedure. Supplementary. As the minister mentioned, the Ford government has uh, created something called the appropriateness group. But their mandate is to find nearly half a billion dollars in cuts, whether they are appropriate or not. <laughs> Another service that's at risk government is paying side, for treatment. People who rely on them say that cutting the treatments will leave them unable to work. Will the Premier rule out cuts to these treatments? Questions been referred to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you. Well, the Appropriateness Working Group is to take a look at what's going to enhance patient care, and I can say that we are very pleased to be working with the Ontario Medical Association on the provisions of Bill 74 that, if passed, will improve patient care. It's going to make sure that care is based on the patient experience and on evidence. That's what we need to make decisions on. That's what we will continue to make decisions on, and we will work with other people who provide frontline care in order to do that. Final supplementary. A review of health services should be focused on what patients need, but under the Ford government, it seems entirely focused on how much funds can be cut and how deep the cuts can be. And for patients who rely on pain treatment or patients who are waiting for MRIs and other procedures, that's frightening, Speaker. Will the Premier come clean today on what services he plans to cut? Minister. Well, the whole purpose of Bill 74, the People's Health Care Act, is to enhance the patient experience, to make sure that people get the services that they need in a timely manner and that those services are connected. That's what we intend to do. That's what we're working on. We know that the patient experience is not what it should be in Ontario right now, that people are not getting their services when they need them, that when they're released from the hospital, they're not getting home care in a timely manner. They sometimes don't even get home care at all, which means they end up back in hospital. We want to connect services, provide Provide access, to, timely access to treatment, and make sure that people get the care that they deserve in Ontario. That's what we're doing with Bill 74 and with the uh, uh, working group at the OMA. Thank you. The next question, once again, the member for Timiskaming Cochrane. Once again, my question to the Premier. For weeks, we have asked the government to publicly commit to public, not-for-profit health care delivery. And for weeks, the Premier and the Minister of Health have done anything but that. They've anything but guarantee Ontarians that their health care scheme will not put our system in the hands of for-profit organizations. Today, we'll be presenting amendments to the government's mega-health bill that will ensure our public health system stays public. If this government is truly committed to protecting our health care system, will they support those changes? 
Premier. Minister of Health. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you. The whole purpose of Bill 74 is to strengthen our publicly funded health care system. I've said that time and time again. And Though the official opposition tries to pretend otherwise, that's not the case. We are strengthening our public system we, with our local Ontario health teams that are comprised of local providers. They are going to make sure that there is coverage across their entire geographic area for all of the patient needs. And If there is any money left over in any one given year, that's going to go directly back into patient care the following year. That's how the system is going to work, to strengthen what we already have, our publicly funded and delivered system. Great plan. Great plan. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the minister just did it again. Publicly funded, what we're saying is publicly funded, but more importantly, publicly delivered health care. These, these, these amendments will enshrine the principles of the Canada Health Act. Specifically, protect and quotations against the expansion of private for profit delivery of services. End of quote. Will the government, government side, support measures that will ensure our health care system stays in public hands? Minister? Well, again, through you, Speaker, I think the uh, member of the opposition is ignoring the facts as they actually are. He knows, as well as every other member of the opposition, there is a lot of health care that is delivered privately, but through the publicly funded system. What about yeah. doctors? What would you do with doctors that are in private students practice? Should we not have any doctors? The medical students are You want to fire here. all those students. What should we do then? We want to make sure that people, anyone who needs health care in Ontario, can get the health care that they deserve, and it is publicly funded. That's the important thing. That's the Please take your seats. Restart the clock. Final supplementary. The people have spoken, and they have told us they do not want the health care system to be dismantled and given away. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. <laughs> Government side, come to order. I apologize to the member for Mr. Mincock having to interrupt him. Restart the clock. Please place your question. Full privatization of health care goes against who we are as Ontarians and Canadians. But it's clear that the Ford government has their own priorities. Fewer health services and more for-profit delivery. Will the government reconsider and stop its plan to open up unprecedented amounts of privatization of our health care system. Minister, please uh, Thank you, Speaker. And again, through you, Speaker, I do not know where this member is getting this information because the people have spoken and the people want better connected access to health care services in a timely manner. That's what people want. Bill 74 speaks about the increase in strengthening our public health care system. That's what it's all about. We want to make sure that people get the services they need. That's what they're telling us. I don't know where you're getting your information, but clearly it's a uh, mistake. Next question, the member for Davenport. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Parents and students were stunned last week to learn that the government is plowing ahead with plans that will lead to layoffs for thousands of teachers and education workers. This morning, we've already seen Government the side, come to order. Global News reports that on Friday, a thousand teachers in Toronto District School Board alone learned they have been declared surplus. And it's clear that the Ford government's decision to expand class sizes is responsible. Does the Premier understand that you can't build a world-class education system at the same time as you're laying off thousands of teachers who provide that education? Any questions to the Premier? Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, it just boggles my mind where they get this information from. We let me let, let me Position make it very board. clear: not one single teacher is going to lose their job. I'm going to repeat it again: not one single teacher is going to lose their job. <laughs> there are currently 125,979 teachers in Ontario. 
from 112,000 in 2004. Wow. We are up 13,000 teachers and 109,000 less students. I understand the NDP, they have it tough doing math as well, Mr. Speaker, but it doesn't add up. It doesn't add up. We're focused on making sure our students are ready for the new economy, making sure they're ready to get out into the work world and focus and, and focus on their math skills, their math skills that 50% of our grade six students are failing math. One third of those teachers teaching these students could not pass the same grade six math test. Supplementary. Well, 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 Mr. Speaker, and back to the Premier, a uh, thousand teachers in the Toronto Public School Board alone get a notice that they likely won't have a job next year. I call that mind-boggling. Yes, I do. And I also call it a fact. The tens of thousands of parents and education workers and trustees and students who gathered on the front lawn this weekend don't believe, believe the Premier's line either. They know that firing side, teachers Jim and cramming more students into overcrowded classrooms is not a recipe for success. This goes against every ounce of research that's out there, Premier. Does the Premier have any evidence that larger classes, fewer course options, and thousands of unemployed teachers is going to improve our schools? Premier? Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, I have to reference an article in the paper. and let, Let's look at the question that was asked in the newspaper over the weekend. I'll read it. So when teachers, their unions, or their advocates claim that the education system is facing deep cuts or being gutted, are they talking about actual facts or are they engaging in fear-mongering? I'll tell you, it's pretty straightforward. It's about fear-mongering. I, I have yet to hear the teachers' union come up with a solution why half our students are failing math, why one-third one of our teachers are failing the same test. We're going to make sure that all new teachers, all new teachers, do proper math testing before they get into the high schools to teach our Response. students. Mr. Speaker, we're keeping the class sizes exactly the same through JK to grade three. We're adding one student from grade four to grade eight, Mr. Speaker. We're making sure that our students. Thank you. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Sault Ste. Marie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Just this past weekend, the Premier travelled to North Bay and on his travels attended the grand opening of a nurse practitioner-led clinic alongside the Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, Ontarians expressed clearly during the election the need to fix the province's broken health care system. Here, here. That is why our government has taken steps towards enhancing health care. Our goal of ending hallway health care has been strengthened by North Bay's new nurse practitioner-led clinic. Mr. Speaker, can the Premier share more about the great news this new health care clinic brings to Northern Ontario? Great question. Questions to the Premier. Well, First of all, I, I want to thank the outstanding MPP from Sault Ste. Marie. He's done a great job. And I want to thank Minister Vic Fideli for having us up in North Bay. What, what a great town both Sault Ste. Marie and North Bay is. We went to a nurses' practitioner uh, clinic, a new one that just opened up. They're expecting to serve over 2,400 people. Their other clinic, uh, Mr. Speaker, serves over 3,000. This is just one step in our plan in making sure we end hallway health care. I had an opportunity to talk to the doctors there and actually the nurses that do a great job. They're excited. I think this would be a great footprint, a great footprint to spread across our province to take the rush hour, per se, off our hospitals, make sure Response. we end hallway health care. Yeah. Supplementary. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Premier for that answer. answer. The opening of the nurse practitioner-led clinic is outstanding news for North Bay and is a step in the right direction for our northern neighbours in ending hallway health care. Mr. Speaker, this is a government that continues to listen to health care workers on the front lines. The fact is, Ontario's doctors and nurses were not supported by the former Liberal government. Shameful. Mr. Speaker, can the Premier tell us more about the critical importance of frontline health care workers in Northern Ontario and across the province? Premier. I want to thank the member from Sault Ste. Marie once again. Mr. Speaker, it was fabulous to walk into this clinic and listen to the nurses. I've said all throughout the election, the backbone of our hospitals, our health care, are the nurses. The people are there right front and center, front and center, taking care of our patients. I'll tell you a story, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, I think it was around 1 o'clock, I was going into my office in Etobicoke. I get a phone call. I get a phone call from a patient up by 400 and, and Finch, the hospital, and, and said, you know, I, they, they, they said they weren't feeding me. I need help. I need this. I need that. And they aren't giving me proper meals. So I thought I'd surprise the person. I didn't have my detail anyway. I just drove up there. I had the best time talking to the nurses, talking to the frontline healthcare workers. They were shocked to see me. But I told them, I told them help is here. We will always support our nurses. Again, they're the backbone of our health care system, and we we're able to speak to the patients in there too. Again, appreciating. Thank you. Next question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, my question is again to the Premier. Let's talk facts, shall we? Last week, and it's a fact, over 150,000 students from 700 schools across Ontario fought back against the Premier's plan to cut their education. They wanted the Premier to hear their voices loud and clear. They reject his moves to increase class sizes, cut time with teachers, and jeopardize their quality of education. But instead of listening to their voices, the Premier dismissed them. He claimed that they didn't organize for themselves and accused them of being nothing more than, and these were his words, pawns. Will the Premier apologize for condescending and underestimating Ontario students? Questions to the Premier. Well, I just want to remind the big labour leaders of the teachers' unions, they don't have a veto on education. They never ran. They've been around forever. The same old leaders have been around forever. They're worried about one thing, Mr. Speaker. They're worried about lining their pockets with the union dues from the teachers. Mr. Speaker, I had an opportunity to speak to numerous teachers, but one over the weekend. And he was frustrated with the whole system. He said we're on the right track. He said the only thing I've ever got off my union is a slice of pizza. One meeting. That's what they, they've received off their union. And I can tell you one thing. We will make sure if the teachers are involved in walking out of the classroom, like any other job, when you walk out of the classroom, you're going to be docked pay. And we, we're, I've heard story Response. after story after story about bulletin boards and, and cutout pictures throughout these classrooms, anti-government uh, posters. We don't believe in that. We believe in making sure we teach our kids. Thank you. Members, please take your seats. Restart the clock. No, nope. stop the clock. Sorry. Government side, come to order. Opposition side, come to order. Order. Restart the clock. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, that about sums up this government, making it up as you go along, right? <laughs> the, organizers, the organizers of the Students Say No campaign, I'm going to give you their names, Natalie Moore and Rain fisher Kwan. They heard the Premier's comments and they drafted a letter to, in response. And their letter says this. 
We are smart enough to know when we are being shortchanged for your own gain, and we are tired of being disrespected, being told that we don't have the autonomy, the power, or the responsibility to organize ourselves. We would greatly appreciate it if you stopped lying to the people of this province in order to discredit our— Order. 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 Member for Davenport, come to order, and the Premier will come to order. Order. The member must withdraw her unparliamentary Sorry, Mr. Speaker, I was reading the letter, but I understand and I withdraw. I can look after this. Order. The member can now place her question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and just to be clear, there were no buses at the student protest. And if you'd shown up at one of them to listen, you, the Premier might know that. Does the Premier believe? Right. Does the Premier believe Question. that Rain and Natalie? Uh, does he believe what they have to say? And will he apologize to them here today? Minister of Education. Members, please take their seats. Been referred to the Minister of Education. Members come to order. I need to be able to hear her. Opposition come to order. Where was the NDP on Thursday? The question's been referred to the Minister of Education. I need to be able to hear her. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I can tell you what we're never ever going to do on this side of the House, and that is we will never ever play political games when it comes to students. Absolute misinformation need to be. I'm going to ask the minister to withdraw the unparliamentary comment. I withdraw. Tip for tap. And conclude her response. Again, Speaker, we are never going to play political games when it comes to the success of our students. You know what? Everything we do is going to be measured and it's going to be responsible. It's going to be based on qualitative and quantitative research, like our consultation pointed us to this last fall. And what are we focusing on? We're not focusing Response. on the games that the members opposite are playing with students. Shame on them. Order. I'll remind the government side, once the ovation erupted, I couldn't hear the minister. I had to cut her off. Member for Niagara Falls, that's not helpful. Restart the clock. The next question, the member for Durham. Energy, Northern Development and Mines, and Minister of Indigenous Affairs. It's no secret that the previous Liberal government made a mess of our electricity system through misguided policies to benefit insiders and force families and businesses to pay too much for their hydro bills. Speaker, our government was elected to fix the hydro mess for the people of Ontario. The Liberals tried to fool Ontarians with their fair hydro plan by keeping borrowing costs off the books. No one was buying what they were selling, certainly not in Durham. That became clear on Election Day. Can the minister please elaborate on why the previous government's fair hydro plan was so unfair for the people of Ontario? Minister of Energy, Northern Development, Mines and Indigenous Affairs. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Durham. She's a real champion for our energy sector, and I appreciate the work she does for her constituents in Durham. What, what a mess, Mr. Speaker, this, uh, uh, this trust fund cover-up was. The Auditor General issues a scathing report, Mr. Speaker. KPMG asked for legal protection in order to work on the scheme. Sounds like a red flag uh, to me, but listen to what our friends at the Globe and Mail reported on this. Quote, Karen Hughes, Associate Deputy Minister of the Treasury Board, said her staff wasn't comfortable with the plan and didn't recommend it. Steve Orsini said the entire public service, service either recommended or supported the Fair Hydro Plan. This sounds like a mess, Mr. Speaker. Bill 87 is appropriately called Clean Up the Hydro Mess Act, and that's exactly what yeah. we intend to do. Supplementary. 
Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to thank the minister for all the great work he's done since we were elected last year. Yeah. Fixing the hydro mess is a top priority for our government, and I'm so glad we're already taking steps to deliver results for the people of Ontario. Families and businesses in Durham deserve to have confidence in their electricity system, and restoring transparency is an important first step. I know there's more work to be done, Speaker, after 15 years of the Liberals' backroom deals and hidden accounting schemes. The people of Ontario can now have faith that their government is working to make their lives more affordable. Can the minister tell us what steps the government is taking to put the people of Ontario first? Minister. Mr. Speaker, transparency is fundamental to this process. Our government replaced the global adjustment refinancing structure with a transparent on-bill rebate, Mr. Speaker. We, we believe that families and businesses deserve to know what the cost of hydro is, and we're in hot pursuit of a cut model instead of further subsidies, but those subsidies will be there on the bill, Mr. Speaker, for the people of Ontario to see, not hidden in a corrupt uh, uh, trust fund. More importantly, Mr. Speaker— okay. I'm going to ask the member to withdraw. withdraw. More importantly, Mr. Speaker, we're going to uh, save the province of Ontario billions of dollars in borrowing costs as, as a result of our fair and transparent plan and we'll be taking the same approach mr speaker when it comes to the job killing carbon tax here, here, which my here. learned friend here mr speaker eliminated last fall hey. and the uh, trudeau liberals have decided to put back in we're going to tell ontarians how much that costs mr speaker here, here. just wait and see Restart the clock. The next question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is to the Minister of Labour. The Minister of Labour has a vital role in the province and a responsibility to show leadership when it comes to collective bargaining and labour relations in Ontario. Last week, the Premier of Ontario disparaged elected union leaders who are advocating for their members, calling them union thugs. Does the minister responsible for labour relations in the province of Ontario agree with the premier's name-calling, or will she take this opportunity to distance herself from the premier's comments? Questions to the minister of labour. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, um, I, I'd, I'd like to give the opportunity to uh, say that collective bargaining is not Order. at risk in the province of Ontario. Uh, employees can still unionize. Uh, we are simply clarifying some um, public sector employers are, are not construction laborers when we talked about Bill 66 and what we passed. But, Mr. Speaker, we are actively engaged in the Ministry of Labour with all stakeholders. That's union side, non-union side, that's businesses. Mr. Speaker, we have a great record in the province of Ontario. Uh, on dealing with collective bargaining. 98% of the discussions are completed with the two parties at the table. So, Mr. Uh, Speaker, through to the member, uh, we have in the province of Ontario with this Response. party uh, and this government a good working relationship with unions and we'll continue to meet with them and have at the table. We certainly have disagreements and we can certainly hear the rhetoric that the Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and again to the Minister. A lot of folks work in this province and there is a lot at stake, especially as those workers head to the bargaining table with this government. As Minister of Labour, she is charged with ensuring fairness, respect and good faith in, re in labour relations in this province. If she won't distance herself from the name-calling of these comments, then how can she credibly do her job? Ontarians need to have faith in the principle of good faith. Will the Minister of Labour clearly state that the Premier's comments were unacceptable? Minister of Labour. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, as the Minister of Labour, uh, we, can, we meet with all stakeholders, all sides uh, of labour negotiations. Uh, we provide uh, uh, a, a service when, as I said, discussions, uh, collective bargaining might be difficult. We, as the Ministry of Labour, 
uh, provide mediators, we provide arbitrators. We are a, a neutral body, should that is ne that is needed from either sides. 98% uh, success rate. Yep. When we Opposition have a record come to order. of 98% success rate, uh, Mr. Pretty Speaker, good. in the province of Ontario, I'm, I'm very proud of the work that my Ministry of Labour does. Uh, do we have some uh, interesting discussions? We certainly do, Mr. Speaker, which is very healthy. Uh, but the Ministry of Labour is there to Response. be used by both sides of collective agreement bargain, bargaining units, Mr. Speaker. I know the press gets involved. I know that the uh, mem the members of the opposition like to do some fear mongering. But, Mr. Speaker, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, member for Ottawa, Vanier. Merci, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Is to the Premier. Kathleen Finley reached out to my office to tell me about her horrible experience of sexual misconduct while in the employ of the Ontario Securities Commission a while back. When she reported the allegation, her boss told her to keep quiet or lose her job. She, it's with her permission that I'm raising this. She approached the Premier's office after the Premier said publicly that he would protect women who came forward to him. She was ignored, but worse than that, her, the OSC was contacted and she received threatening letters and thereafter she was in hospital again. I wrote to the Premier in December and followed up with this office because I wanted to make sure that his office developed victim-friendly protocols when allegations of sexual misconduct are done. So my question to the Premier is this. Will you promise today to deal with Ms. Finley's concern, and will we, you ensure that there's victim-friendly protocols in your office and throughout the government? I ask the Premier to reply. I'll remind all members, please make your comments through the chair. Premier, to respond. Minister of Community and Social Services. Minister of Children, Speaker. Community and Social Services. I thank you very much, Mr. Premier, for the opportunity to, to talk today about the protection and advancement of women uh, in, our, in our province. I would like to thank the member opposite for bringing this uh, uh, particular issue to the floor of the Assembly. As I am not privy to the exact uh, details of this, I would ask that the member opposite meet with me after question period so we can have a conversation on how this ministry, as well as this government, can best protect women across Ontario who are either uh, uh, trying to escape violence, uh, whether that is sexual assault, domestic assault, or sex trafficking in the province. We are highly committed in this government to ensuring the advancement and the equality of women. Uh, we have often said in this legislature that, uh, that strong women must continue to support women in this case, but it's up to all members of this assembly, including the strong members uh, that are males in this assembly, to continue to uh, stand against the, uh, the, the circumstances that we've just heard about. So I'd be pleased to meet with the member Respond. opposite, as well as with my staff after, to ensure that we have uh, some resolution to this. Uh, today. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you. The, my question was for the Premier because the women reach out to the Premier's office. So I hope that this the Premier's office uh, changes the protocol by which they respond. Uh, furthermore, I think uh, Ms. Finley and many women have expressed their concerns about the funding of Rape Crisis Centre. And I know that Hilary Dumena published an article in Now Toronto because she was funding f fundraising for the Toronto Rape Crisis Centre and she ran into the Premier and she was really happy when he gave her $5 to support the Toronto Rape Crisis Centre, but he, seemed, he didn't seem to know that in fact his government had defunded the, the Rape Crisis Centre. So I'm asking again, will this government can fund fully Rape Crisis Centre? It is important, it's crucial for women and that they do so for this year and for years to come. Questions been referred to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Uh, thank you very much. Important question. That's why this government is committed to $174.5 million in funding. And we were pleased to uh, have an $11.5 million commitment just before, uh, before Christmas. And, Speaker, that's important because we're doing a number of things that, uh, th that's new in the province with respect to supporting women who are escaping domestic violence, uh, sexual violence, as well as, as sex trafficking. We're making sure that we have more resources in rural 
communities. And I commend the member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke, the member from uh, uh, Leeds and Grenville, as well as the member from uh, Lanark, Frontenac, and Hastings for bringing these issues to the floor of the Assembly, and they were what inspired us to move forward. I'm presently working with the Attorney General so that we can ensure that there are better victim supports across government, and we're working with the Ministry of Labour so that when we deal with sex trafficking or human trafficking and labour trafficking, that we have a resolution to this. We are Response. a government that is committed to wraparound supports, whether that's in the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Education, the Attorney General, the Ministry of Children and Community and Social Services, or the Solicitor General, and we're committed to doing that because we believe it is the right thing to do. Next question, member for Oakville. My question, uh, Mr. Speaker, is for the President of the Treasury Board. My constituents are very concerned about the sustainability of Ontario's finances. Because of poor choices and irresponsible spending, Ontario was left with a $15 billion deficit and inherited $338 billion in debt when the McGuinty Wynn Liberals left office. Because of the rise in debt levels, Ontario's interest payments on debt are now the fourth largest line item, and it costs us $1.4 million to service the debt every single hour. That's over $30 million in interest payments per day that are not going to roads, hospitals, transit systems, and frontline services. Can the President of the Treasury Board inform the House what actions the government is taking to address this government spending? Great. Questions to the President of the Treasury Board. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member from Oakville for that great question. Uh, it's true, Mr. Speaker, that uh, we inherited a, uh, a spending challenge from the previous Liberal government, an increase of over $200 billion of debt. What did we get for $200 billion? That's the question. Did we get uh, our health care system fixed? No, we no. didn't because the minister. Did we get our education and math scores fixed? No, no. we didn't. Did we get more hospitals, Mr. Speaker? No, no. we didn't. Uh, let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, we spent, the government inherited $72 billion a year spent on wages. Uh, the member mentioned $30 million a day in interest expense. Mr. Speaker, we've announced the consultation so we can begin the process to manage wage in a way that is modest, responsible and sustainable. Uh, these consultations will inform the government on the next steps to Bonds. responsibly manage growth. Our government is committed to working with our partners to ensure that every taxpayer dollar is invested in a fair and sustainable way. Here, here. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the President of the Treasury Board for his answer. It's shocking how much debt that the Liberals actually managed to rack up. Earlier this month, Minister Beth Falvey tabled the 2018 Public Salary Disclosure, more commonly known as the Sunshine List. It showed that in 2018, the number of employees making over $100,000 per year increased by over 20,000 people. Whoa. Since the Liberals took office in 2003, the list has grown by more than 600% wow. and is now over 150,000 individuals. Wow. To me, this shows that the President of the Treasury Board is on the right track by opening up good faith consultations with our public sector concerning wage growth. Can the President of the Treasury Board inform this House as to what action is needed now? Thank you. Once again, the President of the Treasury Board. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member from Oakville. Uh, let me be clear. I'm impressed day by day with our public sector uh, who work hard and are dedicated uh, and work with great diligence. But we must be honest about Yeah, thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, we must be honest about what we can afford while ensuring the sustainability of government programs and services. We cannot manage our spending if we ignore the role that compensation plays in that regard. We must confront intergener intergenerational inequity, and we have to do everything in our power to cushion against future shocks. Let me remind the House that we're in the 10th year of economic recovery. We should be more fiscally disciplined to ensure that we can afford the things that matter most, Mr. Speaker, as I mattered, sustainability of our health care system, sustainability of our education system, sustainability of our social services and our Response. universities, Mr. Speaker. That's why we announced these consultations, and that's what we're going to do. Next question. Member for Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Last week, the President of the Treasury Board delivered a chilling speech about this government's plans to squeeze the wages of public sector workers across the province. 
The government has promised to hold back wages from frontline workers like teachers and nurses, nurses that the Premier just called the backbone of our health care system. I quote the President of the Treasury Board, who referenced trade-offs that will lead to reductions in compensation costs. How much of a reduction in compensation should public sector workers, like our nurses, be bracing for? I, I look to the Deputy Premier. To the President of the Treasury Board. Referred to the President of the Treasury Board. You know, thank you to through you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the member opposite for for that question. You know, our government is committed to restoring sustainability to our uh, public uh, finances while preserving critical frontline services that the people of Ontario depend on. And we've taken immediate actions. We've frozen the executive compensation. We've uh, uh, frozen uh, broader public service compensation. We're consulting, uh, and we're taking uh, steps now to. Uh, fix the incredible mess that we inherited from the previous Liberal government. And one of the first steps that we uh, took, Mr. Sp Mr. Speaker, was to look at all elements of our expenditures, and compensation represents more than half, and it, we believe it's our duty to address the sustainability of public, wa uh, public sector wage trends. So, Mr. Speaker, we need to take firm action to protect the vital frontline pro programs and services now for generations today and for future generations. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, my guess is that frontline workers would like to know how much this firm action is going to cost them. Families have been feeling squeezed for very long. After 15 years of Liberal governments ignoring the increasing cost of living, leaving us with skyrocketing hydro bills and out-of-control housing costs, all while letting wages fall further behind. Now, Ontario families hold record levels of household debt. So my question is, how can this government find millions of dollars to appoint the Premier's friends and Conservative Party insiders to cushy patronage positions while asking public sector workers like our nurses to tighten their belts? President of the Treasury Board, once again. Well, Mr. Speaker, again, thank you to the member opposite through you uh, for that question. Uh, breaking news, uh, Mr. Speaker, we inherited a $15 billion deficit in this province. We inherited $200 billion more of debt since 2003. As someone who worked in the private sector, who worked at uh, a credit rating agency, I know the numbers too well, and uh, inheriting a 40 per cent debt to GDP uh, puts uh, this generation of Ontario's at, Ontarians at risk, and it re puts at risk those programs and services that we uh, uh, matter. Uh, matter the most, uh, Mr. Speaker. I mentioned before that what this government is going to do is make sure that we get on a sustainable path so that we can protect core services in our health care, in our social services, in our education, and in our justice system for the people of Ontario. Yeah, That's yeah. what we're going to do. Question the member for Richmond Hill. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Ontario Solicitors General. Wow. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, every day Ontario's frontline officers do incredible work to keep our families safe. Often this work is silent, preventative, and unseen. Last week, our Premier shared the news that Ontario would once again proudly proclaim the title of Solicitors, Solicitors General. Mr. Speaker, could the Solicitor General please tell the members of the House about the significance of this change for the frontline officers across Ontario? Good question. Good question. Good question. The Solicitor General. It's an incredible honour to serve in Premier Ford's government with such a great uh, depth of talent in Please. our uh, caucus. I, uh, I continue to be amazed at, at how committed and uh, talented the uh, members of caucus are, but I want to assure the member from Richmond Hill that uh, our work continues, and it's all about protecting the front line. It's all about making sure that victims of crime and the individuals who choose not to respect the laws of Ontario uh, are, are appropriately dealt with. I will continue to do that, and I will do it in a way that, frankly, I don't think the uh, Liberals and the NDP do, and that's by listening. listening
listening to the front line and making sure that they share their best practices and the ideas that they have to make Ontario a safer place. It's uh, critically important to our work as a government, and it's something that I'm proud to do as Ontario's Solicitor General. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Solicitor General for her response. Our frontline officers and all of us are proud to having you as our solicitor, Solicitor General. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, over the past 15 years, we witnessed the previous Liberal government fail to respect our frontline officers. It is great to see our government act on the commitment to restore the relationship and respect between the government, frontline officers, and the people. As a member of this government, I'm proud to stand here today and know that we have kept another promise we made to the people of Ontario. Wow. Mr. Speaker, could the Solicitor General please share more about the government's commitment to supporting the frontline officers across Question. Ontario, please? Once again, the Solicitor General. Thank you for the member from Richmond Hill for allowing me to share some of the um, initiatives we've already begun in our ministry. So, of course, uh, recently we passed the Comprehensive Ontario Police Services Act, which made some real changes that are going to improve safety in our streets and allow our frontline officers to do the work that they need uh, to keep our community and our families safe. Uh, we've already initiated some uh, new programs in our corrections facilities because I think we can all appreciate that. Uh, it is critically important that our corrections officers have the tools they need to get the job done and protect uh, individuals who choose not to respect the laws of the land. Uh, there is much work to do with my uh, colleague, the Attorney General, on the uh, probation and parole side, but I want to assure the people of Ontario that we are working as a cabinet, as a caucus, Response. as a government, to make sure our communities are safe. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member from Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. This week, I had a constituent come to my office with a very troubling story. She's a new mom with a six-month-old son who is required, requires prescription formula. The formula was covered by a government program. However, as of April 1st, she no longer receives coverage. It will cost this young family $600 a month. Oh. I'm going to repeat that. It will cost this young family $600 a month because the private insurance does not cover the formula. Did the minister not have the foresight to see this coming when they rolled back job coverage for people in this province? Questions to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, I, I thank the member very much for the question and actually what was in our thoughts was to make sure that all young people who required medication would be able to get it, that the insurers should be the first payers, but if there isn't an insurer involved, that the young person, the child or youth will still get the coverage they need. That was our goal uh, from the beginning, and that is what we are, are planning to continue. However, if there are circumstances where people are not covered fully, then there is also the, the Trillium network that they can apply to. But in, to, with respect to this particular issue, I would be happy to speak with you about it to see how we can be of assistance to this young woman and her, and her child. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. This government has shown time and time again that they will recklessly cut programs in this province with any regards for the effects on everyday people. There used to be a government drug plan program that would help families who need prescription formula. But now, if families aren't covered by a private insurance plan, they're out of luck. Kids are out of luck. When will this government stand up, do what's right, and provide all Ontarians with full prescription drug coverage so no child in this province goes without the prescription formula babies need. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. 
Well, back to the member again. If this is a prescription formula that this child needs, then it should be uh, should be covered. Because uh, if it's not covered, there is a Trillium network that they can apply to. Because what we've actually done is enhanced the system to make sure that all young people are getting the coverage in a sensible way. The insurers should be the first payers. I think that's what the people of Ontario would expect. If there's a private insurance plan, it should cover. But if there isn't one. We want to make sure that every child and young person gets the coverage that they need. So that is what the plan prescribes. That is what it's meant to do. If there's some reason why it's not working for this person, they cannot get assistance through the Trillium Network, please, I would like to speak with you about it to see how the minister can be helpful. Thank you. Next question, the member for Peterborough, Kawaka. Hey! Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to make it crystal clear crystal. who my question is for. It's the most excellent Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Hey! For 15 years, the previous Liberal government hampered the economic potential of Northern Ontario. The Far North Act is a perfect example of how potential jobs and economic growth were limited by the Liberals' failed policy. failed policy. Mr. Speaker, we've heard repeatedly from our colleagues that no one from this region asked for or even wanted the Far North Act, wow. making Ontario open for business and, more importantly, open for jobs, yep. includes the incredible resources that the Far North has to offer. Can the minister inform the House on what our government is doing to encourage economic growth in the North, That's rather than putting up barriers? That's a good question. The Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Peterborough Kawartha for his advocacy and also the work that he's doing on our caucus advisory team. It's invaluable work for, for me as the minister. And I also want to thank my colleague, the Minister of Northern Development, Energy, Northern Development and Mines, and Minister of Indigenous Affairs, for the knowledge that he has on the North and how he has been able to assist me in, in this process. People in the Far North should be very confident that their interests are well represented at Queen's Park. And the member is absolutely right. The previous Liberal government was not interested in what the people in the Far North wanted when they brought in the Far North Act. And as announced in our fall economic statement, our government is in the process of reviewing the Far North Act and have been seeking an input on, pro on a proposal to repeal the Act. Submissions will be continued to be accepted until April 11th. That's going to be a big day in Ontario, Minister or Speaker. And I look forward to the work our, our ahead as our government Response. is committed to making the Far North open for business and open for jobs. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that answer. That's a good answer. Our government's proposal is the type of bold action we need to take right on. if we're going to make the Far North open for business and open for jobs. Here, here. I know the people of the Far North will be relieved to know that help is on the way under the leadership of our Premier and this minister. Instead of, of pandering to special interest groups, mm. our government works for the people. Right on. And the proposal to the repeal the Far North Act will finally help the Far North reach its economic potential. Here, here. Can the minister expand on how the proposal will help the people of the Far North? Now, that's a good question. Minister. Remember again for supplementary. Our goal is to cut restrictions on important economic development projects in the Far North, like the Ring of Fire, all season roads, and electrical transmission projects. Unlike the previous Liberal government, who paid no attention to what the Far North wanted, we will take the time to properly engage with our Far North First Nations partners and other stakeholders, and, Speaker, we will get this right. We will retain any approved land use plans through changes to the Public Lands Act, in addition to any plans that are already in an advanced stage. Our proposal will unleash the economic potential of the Far North, and we are committed to making sure we create job opportunities for every region across this great province. Yeah. Next question, a member for London West. 
Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Following this government's billion-dollar cut to public education last month, 35 educational assistants received layoff notices from the Thames Valley District School Board. This is in addition to the 100 special education learning coordinator positions that were eliminated on March 6. The EA layoffs were announced even as the board prepares for more than 500 students with autism to enter the school system in September, many for the first time. Speaker, this government wants to talk about math, so here's my math question to the minister. When you add 500 students with special learning needs to Thames Valley classrooms and take away 35 of the educational assistants who help them, will students in London be better off or worse off? Questions to the Minister of Education. Really Thank you, Speaker. Question. The answer to that question is stop fear-mongering, because yeah, the fact yeah, of the yeah, matter yeah, is, yeah, yeah. year in and year out, school boards across Ontario work through an exercise whereby surplus notices are given. My question back to the member opposite is, how many year. did they lay off last year and the year before that and the year before that? And if she was and honest with herself, back. her members of her own caucus, as well as the constituents that she's representing, she would be honest and say this is a normal, annual, routine activity that school board Order. Yeah. yeah. Your, your remarks implied an unparliamentary statement. I'm going to ask you to withdraw. Yeah. Were unparliamentary. Withdraw. And supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker, again to the Minister. Like many other school boards, Thames Valley already has a shortage of educational assistance. These 35 layoffs will just make the shortage worse, especially for students with autism. The loss of these 35 EAs means that EAs who wanted to become certified in applied behaviour analysis are being told to cancel their training because there is no one to cover for them in the classroom. Wow. Can the Minister explain how making specialised autism training available to EAs will help support students with autism when EAs can't be spared from the classroom to participate in this training. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And you know what? We have one great big mess that we need to clean up after 15 years of failed leadership in the Liberal government. And we're going to get it right because collectively, between the Minister of Community, Children and Social Services with, and the Minister of Health and myself, we're embarking on a consultation that I hope everybody participates in. It's going to be one of a kind. It's kicking off in May. And I encourage the member opposite to, to tell her stakeholders to be sure to engage in this consultation. In fact, the Minister McLeod invited everyone in this House to participate as well. But the fact of the matter is, Speaker, we're going to get it right because, again, we're not going to stand and thump our chests and fear monger. We're going to be in the trenches working alongside all of our stakeholders, Response. just like we did this last fall. Because again, our consultation last fall has landed us in very, very good positions moving forward. And I have every trust that the consultation that will kick off in May will do exactly Thank you. Next question, the member for Markham Unionville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the hardworking and open mind Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Recently, the Globe and Mail reported that the U.S. government formally requested for the Canadian federal government to renegotiate the Safe Third Country Agreement for asylum seekers. Speaker, we know that the influx of illegal border crossers has placed a significant strain on Ontario's social services system. Can the minister please update the House on the efforts of our government for the people? Yeah. Can I ask the member for Ottawa Centre to withdraw his unparliamentary remark? Speaker, I have a hard time withdrawing a comment that's. I hope the member understands the consequences of refusing to withdraw. I'm going to ask him one more time to with withdraw. I would order, order. The member withdrew. I'd like the uh, 
the member from Arkham Union Bill to conclude his response. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can the minister please update the House on the efforts of our government for the people is taking to hold the federal government to account for the failed border policies? That's a good question. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Yeah, the member from Arkham Union Bill for not only being in this assembly but being a strong voice for newcomers in this country and in particular within this province. And I think he is a great success and a tribute to the immigration system when it's working in the province of Ontario and in Canada. The federal government does have sole jurisdiction of immigration and refugee resettlement policy, um, including those who are eligible to make a claim. But let me be perfectly clear, and we're not the only ones saying this. Every single premier, regardless of political stripe, from every province and territory stood behind our premier, Premier Ford, in August telling the Ontario, the, the, the federal Liberal government that they must pay for their failed border policies in Quebec. We have itemized a list of $200 million that we have expected the federal government to play, and their recent budget is an outright admission to what this government and every other Response. government, provincially and territorially in the, in the country of Canada, has said to the uh, federal government. We are asking them to pay their bills for their failed border policies. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Thank you for standing up for Ontario taxpayers. Here, here. Speaker, the article I mentioned highlights a statement from a federal government official. The official said between 60 and 70 percent of the asylum seekers crossing the border into Canada between points of entry appear to have entered the United States specifically to claim asylum in Canada. These individuals entered the United States on a visitor's visa with no intention of seeking asylum, then illegally crossed our border, claiming refuge. Can the minister explain our government's position on this matter? That's Thank you. Good. Minister, to reply. Much, Peter, this is a very important issue because I believe that Canadians, including all Ontarians, deserve to have confidence in a rigorous uh, immigration process. We know that the Ontario Auditor General is looking into the costs that our province has incurred as a result of the illegal border crossing in Quebec. We know the Parliamentary Budget Officer, as well as the Tr Toronto Neighbourhood Studies, uh, Neighbourhood Studies has validated our concerns with respect to accommodations uh, and, uh, and shelter system. We know the City of Toronto and the City of Ottawa have both come to the table asking the federal government to support us. And that is why this government, along with every other government across this nation, provincially and territorial, has stood behind our Premier, Premier Ford, in asking the federal government to pay its bills. Finally, they have acknowledged that uh, with the recent budget, what we have been saying for the last 10 months is accurate, but we're simply saying to them it's Response. not enough. They are only uh, coming to the table with a minimal amount of money, and that is why I think it's important that the federal government not only acknowledge its problems, but pay for them. Thank you. Next question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Transportation. Speaker, Highway 69 is a connective artery between northern and southern Ontario. It is essential for business, trade, and tourism in our region and into the north. And with many fatalities, Highway 69 has also proven to, proven to be an unreliable death trap. It's been 14 years since the Liberals promised to complete the four laning of Highway 69 to Sudbury, and we are still waiting. The Sudbury Chamber of Commerce has urged this government to fund the four laning of the last 68 kilometres of Highway 69. Businesses are concerned that Northern Ontario's critical infrastructure and transportation deficit is damaging our local economy. Experts tell me the cost of demobilizing a construction project and then remobilizing in the future will be incredibly cost prohibitive. It may be so expensive, Speaker, that Sudbury may never see the completion of the four laning of Highway 69. Will the minister finally tell the people of the north that this government will invest the money we need to finish Highway 69 all the way to Sudbury, and when should Sudbury expect that completion? Thank you, Speaker. Questions to the Minister of Transportation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member opposite uh, for that question. And uh, This is a government that is going to invest in transportation and roads and bridges and highways across the entire province, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we just recently gave $1.3 billion to Ottawa to finish their LRT. We promised a billion dollars to Hamilton uh, to, for their LRT. We just recently announced $1.3 billion for a highway and bridges maintenance across the entire province. Mr. Speaker, this is a government that's going to stand by the Premier Ford's promise to build transit across this entire uh, province, and that includes our important highways, roads, and bridges. And I look forward to having more discussion with member opposite after our budget announcement on April 11th. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. 
Yes. A number of members have informed me they, they wish to raise a point of order. First of all, the member for Willowdale. For Willowdale. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to share some happy news with everybody in the House. On Friday, April 5th at noon, my brother and his wife, Richard and Michelle Cho, gave birth to a healthy, happy baby girl, Chase Cho. Congratulations to them. Thank you very much. Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. At 12.30, I'd like to welcome all members of the Legislature down to the main staircase for a photo to honor or support organ donation and honor the memories of all those who suffered in the Humboldt Broncos' uh, one-year anniversary. And We'll be doing a statement at 1.30 at that, for that as well. Thank you, Speaker. Member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I have some sad news. So, uh, Dr. Wilbert Keon, a former Conservative senator and um, an incredible contributor to health care in our community and in Ontario and in the world, passed away on Sunday. It's very sad news. His contributions are immeasurable, and I just wanted to make sure that everyone was aware of that. Thank you. Thank you. Government House Leader. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I have some happier news that I'd like to share. Uh, this member was elected uh, 29 years ago, and he hasn't aged a bit, and today happens to be his birthday. Let's all wish a happy birthday to our speaker, Ted Arna. And a rising ovation! Government House Leader to withdraw. <laughs> this House stands in recess until one o'clock this afternoon.